This video is going to deal with the various possible barriers that a firm could face in entering a market. We saw when we considered the uh, theory of monopolistic competition that in that simple story of a market, firms faced essentially no costs or other barriers to getting into or getting out of the market. If those barriers were significant, then, of course, some firms might be prevented from entering. And that would upset the basic story that we told about the monopolistically competitive market. So that story was a story where, if there were economic profits, those were going to tempt new firms to come into the industry. Or, as we saw, if there were economic losses, some firms would eventually leave the industry, unless, of course, uh, the underlying conditions improved. So, if we had some significant entry barriers, then that story that we just told breaks down, and those economic profits could continue on into the future for the firms that remained in the market. So, that raises the natural question, what might those barriers be? Well, let's consider a few. One of the most common uh, examples of a barrier to entry is what's called economies of scale. And I expect that most of you have heard that term before, and you probably have some general idea of what it means. So the idea of economies of scale is saying that as the scale of the firm's operations increase, as the firm gets bigger, as it produces and sells more, it experiences some kind of economies. And by economies, we simply are referring to the idea that its average costs are going to decline as the firm gets bigger. So as its rate of production thought of in terms of the amount that it produces and sells every year goes up, average costs are going to decline. We can illustrate that in a basic picture, just showing how average costs can decline as the scale of the firm's operations increase. So down the horizontal axis here, we have the quantity of the firm's product that gets produced and sold every year. You'll notice that I've drawn this so that that decline in average costs stops at some point, and average costs become constant. That doesn't have to be the case. It could be the case that uh, average costs could just continue to decrease, but very often uh, the argument is made that there's some evidence that economies of scale eventually end at some point. And if that happens, then the firm's average cost could simply uh, remain constant instead of declining. I've also uh, labeled average cost in this way. I've called it long-run average cost. And that phrase simply means that the firm has enough time to adjust the way in which it's producing its good or its service so that it can produce at the lowest possible cost. So at any point in time, the firm might be kind of locked into a particular way of producing things, but over time it can make adjustments and perhaps achieve lower costs. Incidentally, we're always assuming here that the firm is able to produce at the lowest possible cost. If you think about uh, what that's really uh, assuming about information, is it's assuming that the firm has very good information about the technology of production and about the best way to do things. Of course, in reality, uh, things are more complicated. I think it would be fair to say 
that firms are always struggling to figure out the best way of doing things, perhaps learning from the best practice that's being carried out by other firms in its industry. Well, we're kind of sweeping those complications uh, out of sight and just assuming that firms know how to minimize the costs of production. Well, where do these economies of scale come from? Let's think of some explanations. One common explanation for economies of scale is to say that uh, they occur when a firm has uh, significant fixed costs as a, as a part of its total costs. So if we think of what average costs consist of, they consist of the average of the firm's fixed costs and the average of its variable costs. So if those uh, total fixed costs are very high, if they're a high uh, proportion of the firm's total costs, then we would expect to see um, a significant effect on the average cost relationship. So, if the average fixed costs are very large, then you would expect that that's going to dominate how average total cost behaves. And we've seen that in uh, a numerical relationship uh, outlined in uh, the table that we saw uh, in the very first lecture. Well, what might those fixed costs consist of? I think there are a variety of costs that firms have to pay, more or less regardless of how much they're producing and selling. One of those costs is basic research and development. Just to develop the product that's going to be sold, some upfront costs are required. Then if the product is going to be sold, you may have to in, um, endure some advertising and marketing costs, which again could be more or less independent of the amount that's actually being produced and sold. There's a second way in which economies of scale could arise, um, perhaps separate from the idea of fixed costs. So we could imagine that if a firm operates on a larger scale, it can produce its product or its service in a different way. So for example, uh, if we imagine the production of some a physical good like a machine, like, a, like an automobile, for example, you can imagine that the work that could be required to produce that, and to put it together, could be divided up into different ways. So you could imagine, uh, for example, assembly lines organized in different ways, depending on the overall volume of production. The overall uh, scale of production could also influence the kind of machinery that could be used, say, in producing something like a car. Uh, if you've ever been to a car factory, uh, you would have seen perhaps large parts of it that were simply run by robots. But it might really require a large scale of production in order to justify the expense of automating uh, the uh, production of cars in that way. Well, how important are economies of scale in practice? When economists have looked at actual costs of production in industries and have surveyed managers about uh, what they think their costs look like, uh, they found that economies of scale are actually very common and are found in many industries. All right, well, so what? Uh, why are economies of scale important when we're talking about barriers to entry? Let's go back to our basic picture here again. Let's imagine that there are already firms in the industry operating at a fairly large scale. 
so that they are enjoying the relatively low costs that come with a high scale of production. Now, if a new firm wants to come into the market, it's really got two choices. It can enter the market uh, at a fairly low scale of operation, but if it does so, this uh, description of costs tells us that that new firm is going to face relatively high costs. So it's going to have to compete against existing firms that are there producing at a relatively low average cost. Obviously, that's not going to be easy to do. So we can just summarize to say that the existing firms are going to have a cost advantage and a new firm is going to experience higher costs. The story that I've just told is assuming that the new firm is using exactly the same technology as the old firm. Perhaps it's entering because it's discovered some new technology that other firms don't have. Well, we could tell more complicated stories like that in which perhaps a new firm might not experience such a big cost disadvantage. Another thing that we could remember in thinking about economies of scale is that earlier story about high fixed costs. So if it were the case that new firms had to make a big initial investment, if they faced high costs of just entering the industry to, say, try to produce at a relatively large scale of production, they might have difficulty raising the funds to do that. After all, it's risky to enter a new industry and it might be difficult to borrow that money. Of course, there might be large firms around that might have those resources and that might be entering this industry, in which case this issue may not be so important. Finally, I want to distinguish this whole story of economies of scale, which is talking about the costs of production uh, when we're thinking about producing different amounts per year, for example. I want to distinguish that idea, the economies of scale, from something else that I'm sure you've heard of uh, called the learning curve, or more generally, the experience curve. So here the idea is that the cost of production depends on how much experience we've had over time in uh, producing whatever good or service it is that we're making. So our average costs depend on the total amount of experience, the total amount that has ever been produced, what here is described as cumulative production up to the present. So cumulative just meaning the adding up of everything in the past right up to the present. So this is kind of a separate idea from the current rate of production, which is the focus of economies of scale. So for example, you could have a relatively small firm with lots of experience, so it may not be operating at high scale, but it could, over time, as it acquired more and more experience, lower its average cost of production. And again, I've I've drawn a flat portion of this curve uh, just to illustrate the possibility that um, at some point that additional experience may really not be worth anything much. Well, clearly this is a separate barrier to entry because existing firms simply have more experience. They've been around longer, they've learned more about how to lower their costs. So a new entrant is always going to be uh, at a disadvantage.
Well, just to wind this up, I would just like to note that the uh, story of economies of scale and this story of the experience curve uh, can both happen at the same time. No reason why not. So we could look at the description of economies of scale here. Here are uh, variable is the quantity per period of time. And it could be the case that if experience is important in this particular activity, that year after year, as more experience is acquired, the average costs could gradually decrease. So there's no reason why we couldn't put those two stories together depending on the importance of experience in affecting average costs. Okay, so in the next video, I'm going to consider some other things that can be barriers to entry.